From KUNC and the NPR Network, this is In the NoCo. I'm Erin O'Toole. Limiting the carbon emissions of a new home or office long before anyone lives or works in it. That's the goal of a key piece of Boulder's new energy code that will take effect later this year. Now, typically, people looking to reduce the carbon footprint of their home or office might install a heat pump or add solar panels. But those improvements could take years or even decades to substantially reduce a building's carbon output. That's why Boulder officials looking to fight climate change are embracing a concept called embodied carbon. Embodied carbon looks at the components that make up a new building or major renovation project, things like concrete foundations and insulation, and it factors in the carbon emissions caused by their manufacturing and delivery. Boulder City Council member Lauren Folkerts is an architect who pushed for the new guidelines. She joins us now to talk about what impact she hopes they'll have in Boulder and on a larger scale. Lauren, welcome. Hi, Erin. Thank you for having me today. Help us understand why the construction of a building is an important time to look at reducing carbon emissions. So the construction of a building requires lots of different components, particularly concrete, which is overall one of the products that has the largest environmental impact worldwide. Mm. And the emissions that those create are released instantly you know, before the building is occupied, all of those global warming emissions are um, in the atmosphere and affecting our environment. I had no idea that concrete was such a high producer of emissions. Does that surprise people when they learn that? I think it does. Having gone to architecture school, it's something you learn pretty early. But I don't think that people realize how big of an impact that is. I think estimates range between 6 and 8% of emissions worldwide are related to concrete. Wow, that's incredible. So really, a huge percentage of your home's overall carbon output happened when it was being built. Absolutely. Lauren, you pushed hard for these new guidelines. Why was embodied carbon such a key focus for you? And how did you make it a priority for a city government that has plenty of other issues to address? So for me, I think it's really important to look at that whole life cycle, like I was talking about. It it also has a little bit to do with not betting against ourselves. These emissions um, are released up front, and there's nothing we can do about them. On the other side, the amount of energy buildings use changes over time, particularly as we look at improving our infrastructure. As we add more solar to the grid, there's actually less emissions produced um, to heat and cool buildings. So this is becoming a bigger and bigger piece of the puzzle, especially in a city that is working so hard to clean up its grid and where we get our power from. Was it hard to get the embodied carbon guidelines added to the code? What was that process like? It's always hard to start a new conversation about something that people aren't talking about that much. (laughs) In this case, in this case, I um, had to do a little bit of education with council colleagues to make sure that I had support from other members of council. And I also had to push pretty hard on staff uh, Mm. to to get them to understand how serious I was about having this incorporated into our new code updates. I bet your background uh, was very helpful in this. You know what you are talking about. (laughs) And it doesn't hurt that construction can be a little bit of a full contact sport similar to council. (laughs) Lauren, a lot of the goals for Boulder's embodied carbon guidelines seem to call for more natural materials like wood to be used and less plastic in materials like insulation. What's the goal there? So wood products or products that um, are derived from plant materials tend to be more carbon neutral or have the ability to actually trap carbon. You know, a tree takes carbon out of the atmosphere to turn it into wood. And as long as that wood is preserved in a building, you're essentially keeping it from being in the atmosphere. So they can have, a, it's a way for us to store carbon and keep it out of the atmosphere. Conversely, that makes sense. plastics are oil and gas products, essentially. And so they tend to not only 
um, have a lot of chemicals involved in their creation. But, you know, there are some potential downsides, both with recyclability and indoor environmental air quality. Sure. And you mentioned, you know, with projects where you want to recycle some materials, it sounds like if something is coated in plastic, that's not possible. Yeah, that's one of my pet peeves is right now the industry spray foam plastics are so popular because they create a lot of air sealing, which helps us um, reduce those heating and cooling loads. But they're sure. essentially like spraying glue on everything. And so all those wood studs in the wall are no longer recyclable like that house was that was built in the 1950s. Um, so that will mm. make future construction adaptation and recycling and much more difficult. So the new guidelines operate within a point system where kind of a conservation point system where a builder agrees to take enough steps to lower your embodied carbon and then you can proceed with construction. If I understand correctly, this will be the first time embodied carbon is included in this point system. What are you hoping this accomplishes for Boulder? I'm really hoping that it helps us take the first easier steps getting our concrete mixes to be more sustainable. If every house does a little bit to reduce the embodied carbon, overall that can create a huge reduction. So really it's trying to push the material producers to bring these to market at scale in a way that makes them more and more cost competitive. The more builders are using these materials, the more they will have to be produced and available. Yeah. And the more it's not a specialty product that's only available at the one mill across town or the one concrete plant. It's everyone has that as an option because they need to in order to compete in our market. So I'm curious, what has been the reaction from builders and contractors as you have discussed these guidelines? Whenever we have new guidelines, I think there's always a lot of concern about impacts on timelines and costs. But generally, as I've talked to people about the details of it, their concern goes away a little bit. A lot of what we're requiring at this initial stage is fairly straightforward and should be easy to implement. I, I know that a few other cities have experimented with embodied carbon guidelines to meet some of these climate goals as well. What do you hope Boulder's guidelines will accomplish on a national or global scale? You know, we love being a model. Our practice here hopefully will help us learn more about how we can do this even better and will also show other cities that it's possible and encourage them to think about similar guidelines and rules. Lauren Folkerts, thank you so much for talking with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Erin. If you want to read more about Boulder's new embodied carbon policy, we have linked to an article by Boulder Reporting Lab in our show notes and at KUNC.org. That's it for us today on In the NoCo. I'm Erin O'Toole. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>